Please welcome Ariane Gorin, President, Expedia for Business of Expedia Group, in conversation with Skift founding editor and executive editor, Dennis Schau. Good morning, London. People online, good morning, good afternoon. We see you. Don't we, Ariane? Don't we see you? We them? do. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. President of Expedia for Business. That's not Expedia Corporate Travel, right? No, it is not. Please uh, explain to everybody what your fiefdom is. Oh, my fiefdom. Your fiefdom. <laughs> so Expedia for Business is actually an entity that we created last summer. And for the first time at Expedia Group, we've brought together all of our partnership businesses into one team. Uh, so that means it's the, uh, the teams that are working on partnerships with hotels and airlines who are supplying uh, to our brands and to our marketplace, uh, the team that's working with advertisers, and the team that's working with other travel companies that we power. And in fact, the idea behind it all was to say, you know, we, we want to be able to talk to partners, and if you're a hotel, to say, look, yes, you want to distribute through us, you may want to advertise with us, we might power your package business, uh, and making it such that there's only one person and one team that you need to talk to, we think will really facilitate the relationships and open up more opportunity for everyone. So it's a su significant chunk of Expedia's business. I think your B2B segment was about 17% of revenue in 2021. Yeah, that's the revenue that we do through our B2B partners. So we have our brands and then the B2B partners. And then, of course, this team also uh, sort of works on all of the supply that, that supplies all of the brands as well. Right. And I think you mentioned earlier the, the corporate travel part. It, we had had Agencia as part of that. Right. But uh, that's now part of Amex GBP. You sold that. Yeah. Right. So we're going to talk more about Expedia for Business, but let's t first just talk briefly about Ukraine and, and, uh, and the Russian invasion. So Expedia was, um, if not the first, among the first that announced that you were pulling out of uh, Russia and Belarus. Yeah. Um, so tell us, uh, you know, what went into that decision and what else you are doing to support Ukraine? Yeah. Uh, so first, I think just for all of us, especially being in Europe today, it's, uh, I mean, it's, just, it's almost unfathomable to think that there's war going on in Europe. So I just want to take a moment. I think we all um, feel strongly about what's, what's happening. But as you said, what we did is, you know, the first thing when you have a situation like this is to look at uh, what do we need to do for the business. So we very quickly realized we would stop travel in and out of Russia. Then we needed to think about, okay, what about the travelers who are in trip, travelers who have bookings already on the books? What kind of flexibility do we need to put in place for them? Then you think about the employees. I mean, this is really, it's almost the COVID playbook, right? Then you think about our employees. Uh, do we have employees in the region? What do we need to do for them? Uh, do we work with tech partners? So I think many companies work with technology companies in Ukraine and thinking about what's the, you know, how do we take care of them? What's the business continuity? And then it became very much about, you know, how can we contribute to, to help the situation? And uh, we have a lot of employees in Eastern Europe who have, you know, who you know, our employees in Poland have brought in refugees to stay with them, uh, have gone to the borders to bring supplies, have done fundraisers. We did a corporate matching program, uh, five to one employee matching, and we've, uh, I think, donated over a million dollars to charities. So it's really looking at then, you know, what can we do to help? And you and I were talking about this right before. I think for many of us in this room, we have job opportunities in Europe. And so I think the next step is then to look at, for refugees who are getting displaced, what can any of us do to help place them in jobs? So you're trying to do that? Yeah, we're looking at how we can work on Excellent. that. So um, <clears throat> I criticized Airbnb a little bit. A lot of, a lot of people are um, booking stays in Ukraine. You know, they're not staying there as a way to support hosts. Um, but what uh, a lot of people didn't realize is some of the contributions are going to uh, big property management companies. Um, Airbnb doesn't really distinguish between individual hosts and property management companies. So somebody might have like 33 or 35 listings or whatever. You, you might be giving money to a big company that's not even based in Ukraine. It could even be based in Moscow. So 
Um, our Expedia, I mean, Verbo, I'm sure, doesn't have a big uh, yeah, we, footprint in Ukraine, but is that going on? So we do have some properties um, in Ukraine, and many of them are private hosts. And in fact, on our, our sites, we label something a private host. We did see a spike in bookings. Um, and actually, if you looked at the communication between the traveler and the homeowner, you know, it was very clear. It was the traveler saying, look, I'm not planning to stay there, but I'm donating money. And you could see the response of the homeowner, you know, obviously very thankful. Um, so what we did is we waived our traveler service fees, um, and you know I think some of that is just sort of organic behavior. Right, but you do identify: is this an individual host or is this? It's an individual. It says private host. Yeah. Right. So we don't know the name of the company that it is, but it'll yeah. say private host it'll say private if it's an individual. Yeah. Okay. So um, in terms of what you're seeing now in Europe, what are some of the trends you're seeing for summer travel and, um, and that sort of thing? So I know we just saw a lot that was sort of a, oh God, here are all the problems we're facing, but I think we're gonna have an amazing summer. I mean, you know, the, the uh, stat about how much income or how much money people have saved, you know, people wanna spend it on travel, and hopefully all of us in this room are seeing that. So when we look at sort of what's shaping up for Europe, first of all, we see in, uh, in UK, France, and Germany, that we're already back to the same trends of mix of international versus domestic shoppers as we were pre-pandemic. I think we'd all seen that you know, during the pandemic, uh, a lot more travel was domestic, so international has opened up. Uh, when we look at US travelers who are searching to come to Europe, you know, that's up quite a bit as well. And the booking windows are expanding, which to me tells me it's sort of people who are gonna be coming here for the summer. So uh, I think we're gonna have a great summer. Right. So you, it doesn't sound like you're overly concerned about uh, the next variant that uh, that's gonna you know, dampen the summer. Yeah, I think that the, you know, everybody says that we learn to live with COVID. And right. uh, yeah, I think the question is gonna be uh, how, how much friction is there going to be in travel? Like what we saw is even a couple weeks ago when the UK removed all travel restrictions, and I would say even before that, there, there, were quite, there weren't even that many, but once everything was removed, we saw a 65% increase in shopping for the Easter period. So I think the question is really gonna be uh, what kind of restrictions then go back in place, if right. any at all. So a lot of things are sort of reverting to a semblance of 2019. But what about things like work from anywhere, digital nomads, um, what else? Uh, the comeback of cities, are you, are you seeing this sort of thing? So certainly the comeback of cities. I mean, I think, again, we all probably saw that during the pandemic, there was uh, more secondary and tertiary destinations that, uh, that, you know, that were seeing a lot of demand. You know, I remember being in Madrid last summer and talking to a hotelier there who said, you know, like, we're missing all of the international tourists who are coming to the city. So in our shopping patterns, we're seeing a lot of demand into the cities. Um, on the digital nomad, you know, I think we certainly are seeing the comeback of, of work travel, of business travel. Um, I think it's gonna be longer trips. It's going to be uh, probably mixing the sort of work and pleasure a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and as we start to see companies bringing employees back to the office, I think that's also a moment that we'll, you know, we'll see what, what the trends show. Speaking of digital nomads, I noticed that uh, right before the pandemic, Expedia opened a $1 billion office campus. You know, a, that's, that's, a big, that's a big place to fill. I snuck in there once. But I, know. In a I remember and that. Stuff. <laughs> so, but, um, I think we're having a town hall. Uh, so yes, right. we opened, we have an amazing, uh, beautiful office right on the water in Seattle. Um, and actually, even here in London, we, uh, during the pandemic, we renovated our office space so that we're, we used to be over three offices, and we're now in one. Um, and you, know, you could say, oh, well, was that good timing given that people are now sort of working hybrid? And I mean, I think as long as you can give people a great space to work in, it will generate creativity. And in fact, earlier this week, I was, uh, we had a welcome breakfast for anybody who joined our company since uh, the beginning of the pandemic uh, in London. So there were about 75 people there. And I was at a table with six people, quite sort of young people, developers, and they were so excited to start to have people come back to the office because they said, Ariane, this is how we're gonna learn from people. Like, this is how we're gonna make connections. For a lot of them, it was their first jobs out of school. So, 
I think the idea of being back in the office sort of half time was really exciting to them. Yep. And having people at a conference and actually it's amazing to seeing see people, people and having a drink with people. It's great. So um, Peter Kern, CEO of Expedia Group, has talked about your bailiwick, uh, Expedia for Business, the B2B segment, as being a big growth opportunity for Expedia. And one thing he mentioned is he would like to see um, Expedia start distributing Verbo's inventory uh, to, to your partners who include banks and travel agencies and whatever. Has that started yet? So we, I would say we're dipping our toes into it, mm -hmm. but we want to make sure that uh, that when we do it, there's a great traveler experience because it's not as straightforward, uh, the sort of reselling of Verbos and homes mm -hmm. necessarily as hotels. So we have a pretty big business where we power other travel companies, other online travel agents, banks, corporate travel agents and the like. And we do a lot of business with them in hotels. Um, and so as I said, we're dipping our toes and they're very interested in getting the homes but we just need to figure out how do we make sure that it's a great traveler experience. Right. So let me hit you up with uh, one of my theories. My theories are often wrong. I mean, I thought that Reagan could never get elected president because he was too old. He had two terms. But um, so during the pandemic, we've seen uh, Booking.com has uh, launched flights. It ex greatly expanded its flights business. Um, they bought e-travel, they're in the process of buying e-travel-i, they bought Get a Room, a, a wholesaler. Um, E-Dream is, is expanding with a subscription business. Um, Airbnb seems to be doing well. But Expedia, to me, seems like it's still preoccupied with restructuring. I mean, you just said with Verbo, you know, we're dipping our toe into it. We don't have the guest experience right yet. So is Expedia sort of being left behind while, you know, while other companies made hay during the pandemic? Yeah, I wouldn't mind if people thought that because yeah. then we could be, you know, in stealth coming out even stronger. But oh. I mean, I, I disagree with that. Okay. You know? I think we've actually used the last couple of years. Uh, yes, we've done some simplification of the company. And I would say for good. You know, the, the deal where we sold Agencia to American Express Global Business Travel and retained an equity ownership you know, to me, that's a pretty groundbreaking deal, and it's great for the company because we're now owners of, I think, what's going to be a really successful corporate travel business, and we've simplified our company. We've done a lot of work in sort of replatforming our technology stack so that when we do develop things like our virtual agent with all the skills that will help travelers have better experiences, that will go across all of our brands, whereas in the past, it would have just been on one brand. Um, we announced a big loyalty refresh. So across Expedia Group, we have about 145 million loyalty members, which is massive. Uh, but those members aren't able to earn and burn points across all lines of business. And what research shows is that what travelers are interested in is the breadth of being able to earn and burn. Right. So we're in the process of creating that. It takes a little bit of time, but I think when it comes out, it's going to be massive. Right. So I mean, that was announced last year. and. You know, it was said, you know, we, we, don't, we haven't figured it all out yet, but yep. so that's still, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be hearing something about that this year? We'll be hearing something about that. Okay. Um, and then with, with business travel, I remember the days when to be an OTA, you had to have a business travel unit. You know, Expedia had one, Travelocity had one, Orbitz had one. You bought them all, and now you don't have one. So... Uh, well, what I would say is yeah. now we power a lot of different corporate travel companies out there. And again, part of the Agencia deal was thinking about what do we need to own versus you know, where can we power others? And again, I'm sure many of you in the room in the last couple of years have really had to think about you know, what do I need to do and where can I partner with someone else? And how do I spend my sort of time and resources on the things that make a difference? And you know, I think corporate travel is a massive part of the business. And if we can participate in it, by powering others and benefit our hotel partners because of course they're interested in, you know, for the top part of the market, they may have corporate negotiated rates, but this idea of how do you aggregate and reach a bunch of the demand to small and medium businesses, mm -hmm. if we through our partnership strategy can, can add that value to them, I think it's a win-win. So I, I don't want to fail to mention this. So I was looking at uh, Expedia's numbers 
So um, Expedia in general, the revenue is about like 80 something percent of what it was in 2019, but international, including Europe, is only about half. So Europe has really lagged um, the US, for example, right? Yeah. Well, you know, historically, our, our company has been quite strong in the US, uh, US, sort of in North America. And of course, what we saw in the sort of in the last couple of years is with more domestic travel, you know, you get stronger in your home market. And a lot of our business uh, sort of in Europe and in Asia was international long haul or international short haul. And so I would say those were the demand patterns that were just disrupted. And you see that in the numbers. But I think it's going to come back. Right. So I don't know if this is your terrain or not, but um, Expedia uh, last year launched a program in the UK and France to lure Airbnb super hosts um, to to lure, to entice them, to steal them. Not really steal them because you're not requiring exclusivity. You could, you could be an Airbnb super host and also uh, be on Verbo. But how has that gone? Has that been successful? So I actually, I don't have the stats to okay, tell you sure. how it's gone. But what I will say is that kind of thing is, you know, look, when you meet with a hotel or an airline or a host or whoever it is, everybody's looking at how do they maximize their distribution. and. Sometimes that's adding more distribution. Sometimes that's going deeper with sort of one provider because they can do more for you. Um, and I think you know, we want to make sure that every time we have partnerships that we understand what value we're bringing and that our partner understands it. So if, right. if we did a program like that, it's because we think that we can add value to these hosts. Again, with uh, Expedia being preoccupied, I've, I've talked to hosts in Europe who said, you know, you launched the program in the US early last year you launched it in, in France and the UK towards the end of the year, and they've said, you know, what, you know, what is taking them so long? They're, 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 there's a lot of anger among Airbnb hosts about how they handled the pandemic ref refund policy. You know, why is Expedia blowing this opportunity? They, there's so much opportunity there. There's always a lot of opportunity. I would right. say, you know, we're going to look at how, how do we how do we capture it? So. Right. Um, so you, you guys have been doing a lot of deals. You have the, uh, a deal with um, MXGBT to provide them inventory. You also just recently announced a deal with um, IHG uh, to be what I call the rate parity police. I, I wouldn't use those terms. <laughs> I would say that the deal that we did with IHG, which is similar to the deal we did with Marriott, uh, which we call optimized distribution, is basically uh, looking at how do we help them to simplify and to get consistency in the way that they're distributing, uh, sort of forward distributing their inventory. You know, it actually, it was an interesting story. It started a few years ago with Marriott where the, you know, what they were saying was, look, A, we want to simplify the technology of how we're distributing. We want to have a better traveler experience with more consistency in the content and the photos. You know, we don't want people showing up to the front desk and saying, oh, we thought we were going to have a pool, but it turns out you don't have. So there's you know, a lot about making sure the content is up to date. And of course, sort of having you know, price consistency. Um, that program has, really, has worked very well for Marriott. They've made comments publicly about it. Um, so we're really excited about uh, working in a similar way with IHG. And by the way, I mean, I think it's something that can help the whole industry. So no one in this room will remember this, but in 2004, IHG exited Expedia for several years over trademark issues and thing like, things like that. And now they're partnering with you on, on rate parity. Well, and so I wasn't in the travel industry <laughs> back in 2004, but it does seem like in our industry sometimes you know, there's big arcs uh, of things. But it, it really represents, I think, what we're trying to do with the partnership business in Expedia, which is to say, you know, where are there areas that we believe that you know, when we listen to our partners and what their needs are, that we can contribute to them? And I think it opens up a lot of new possibilities, and I think the years ahead are, are going to be rich in possibilities. So as part of uh, Shedding Brands this year, you um, uh, sold or, um, Silver Rail back to its owners. I don't know if anybody from Silver Rail is here. There we go. But so here we have. Um, Expedia doesn't offer rail now, yep. right? It doesn't offer business travel. So there, there, there seems to be some 
You're not pursuing the connected trip strategy, are you? Oh, well, I would say we've been doing connected trips. Like, we were the first to do connected trips. If you look at what we were doing. There's no business travel. There's no. But, yeah. So I wouldn't say, I mean, there's not that there's no business travel. Like, right. business travel requires a lot of complexity beyond what a leisure business does. It requires duty of care. It requires you know, policies, approvals. It requires all of those things. And again, I think during the pandemic, we all had to think about you know, in the limited resources we have, where do we want to focus them? And is there someone who could be even better if they're 100% focused? So again, I think you know, we have exposure to the business travel through the partners that we have, and we think that they do a great job in that. It seems like Airbnb has some advantages because they're focused pretty much solely on short-term rentals, whereas Expedia's got its hands all over the place. Our hands all over the place. You know, yeah, we're talking well, about no, well, you know, full you know, yeah. yeah, so certainly we have a broader range of product offerings. And if I go back to the loyalty program, I actually think that, that that's a something that's really attractive to travelers, right? They're gonna be able to earn and burn across all lines of business. And I was reading somewhere recently, you know, look, traveler trends are changing quickly, right? They did during the pandemic, now are they reverting back, are they not? And for us, having this diversified business, uh, you know, is it cities, is it not cities, is it home rentals, hotels, actually I think allows us to, to respond even better when there are changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's take an audience question from Carlos. Ariane noted that they want to make sure there's no friction in the travel experience for business travel with Verbo. Well, I don't think it was business travel with Verbo, but what are the challenges? So uh, some of it was business travel, but some of it was just in general. Is when you're booking a home, uh, and there may not be obviously a front desk there, there's more communication between the traveler and the homeowner. So saying, hey, you know, either I want more information about you know, how I'm going to check in or whatever it might be, that communications path, you know, I would say we've, we've done that really well on Verbo where we're owning the, the interface. But if we think about powering partners who we're providing them this information via an API and they're building their own interface, figuring out how to get that flow to work well um, can be a bit tricky. Right. So some of that is what we need to do in the APIs that we're providing. And then some of it is then on the partner side, how are they integrating it and how are they servicing it? I think even on Expedia.com, uh, Peter has said that the, the, the user experience isn't where you want it to it's be. It's not where we want it to be, that's right. Right. Um, there's been so much talk about quote unquote FinTech um, in the travel industry. Hopper seems to be growing like crazy and uh, makes a lot of its money on you know, price freezes and that kind of thing. Uh, is Expedia looking at that or do you find that interesting? I mean, like I, and we saw the slide earlier, Hopper's doing a great job on that. So right. yes, we're looking at, when we already have an insurance product, so we're looking at how do we evolve that. Um, you know, it's, I think we're always looking at what's interesting for travelers and you know, how do we respond to it. Um, given that you're trying to simplify the business, is M&A not on the, agenda, on the agenda in the next few years, or will Expedia see a hopper or something interesting and, uh, and go for it? Yeah, you know, I think right now we're very focused on you know, what's in front of us. I mean, we've got big tech things to launch. We've got our big loyalty program to launch. There's so much opportunity in B2B. So, you know, of course, if there's something that you know, is interesting that can complete the portfolio, why not look at it? But I would say right now the focus is very much on you know, just what's in front of us. Ditto for subscriptions. I mean, I see yeah. um, you know, TripAdvisor is having, yeah. I'll kindly put it, mixed success with sub subscriptions. Yeah. But eDreams is uh, doing, really well, yeah. doing really, really well with it. And, um, yeah, I would say it, it, you're right. E-Dreams is doing quite well with it. I think we don't have a plan right now to go right. into it. I think we're, as I said, focused on what are the things in front of us, the loyalty program, the replatforming, uh, the, the B2B part. Right. Um, so in Europe, what, what, what are the biggest challenges now to, to get back on track? And uh... Yeah, I think probably the biggest one, uh, when, when I talked to a lot of our hotel partners, our airline partners, and we saw it before, is staffing shortages. Right. Um, you know, it's having enough people in the hotels, having enough people, uh, you know, on the flights. 
uh, to be able to service travelers. What we've noticed is actually if you look at travel reviews in hotels, uh, there are more and more, when you look at the recent ones, complaints about, hey, I didn't have the service level. And interestingly, when hotels signpost it that there are gonna be you know, lower services, we're not gonna clean the rooms as often, or they respond to the comments, travelers are pretty you know, accepting of that. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think probably the biggest issue that uh, the industry is gonna be facing is service levels. And in fact, some hotels, probably people in this room, aren't running at full capacity intentionally, mm -hmm. so you make sure that they keep the service levels. And of course, we saw before the ADRs aren't going down. Right. Um, so. so this will be an ongoing challenge. And our ongoing challenge is the next speaker. Thank you <laughs> Thank very you much. Thank you so much. I hope it's not a challenge. <laughs>